Hello everybody, this is EF. This is the first episode of a new series, a series about game hacking. Uh, this is game hacking, more specifically on GNU Linux operating systems. As you can see in the background, I'm playing a video game. It's a free video game available on Steam called Vencoa. Uh, this is based on the Gold Source engine, which is the engine used by Half-Life. And it's very similar to the engine of Counter-Strike, Global Offensive or Garrus Modes. So if you, if you want to make a hack for these games, then this is... A, I would say this is a kind of a good series, really. Uh, I will. I want to talk a lot about details because there are not really any resources available on the internet about game hacking on Linux, how to use the POSIX uh, tools and library to modify memory, how proc maps works with the Linux kernels, kernel, uh, all that kind of stuff, which I did not really find any documentation online, so I had to dive a lot. I had to invest a lot of time into the manual pages and the online documentations I could find. Uh, so in this series, I will make I will be making a fully featured hack for the games of Enco Uh With uh, I will start by probably making a menu or something like that, and then I will add some features that you know for hacking video games anyway. Um, so this is the first episode. I will go around setting up the project. Uh, injecting code into the game and dealing with a debugger uh, of your choice even though I'm actually going to be using uh, GDB and shit engine so if you know how to use those then you will have kind of a head start but if you don't know, do not know it's not really a problem I will try to explain how they work and how you can use them anyway so let's get started with setting up the project all right so we are back so I just created a little folder called it Svinkoa. And inside this folder, I created three other folders. So I created a build. That's where we're going to build the binary. And we're going to uh, use our as our cheat. Uh, this is one for the libraries. So that's the external libraries that we're using. I'm currently using FMT. So I talk a little bit about it, but you really don't need to use it. It just makes things a little simpler when you want to print stuff. But it's just, uh, it's really optional, actually. It should normally, if you watch this in the future, it should be a feature of C++. Then a source di directory. Every file that we're going to put inside of this is going to get compiled into our final uh, executable right there. It's not an executable, but our final file. Um, and then we have a CMake list, very standard. So uh, we set a minimum version name of the project. I want to call it hack because it's not original. Uh, then I you set I set some version, so I'm gonna be programming in C plus plus twenty. Might switch to C plus plus twenty three uh, if it comes along. Uh, if some support for it comes along in GCC, but yeah. Uh, so this is important. It sets the builds to build the thirty two bit binary. So you need to build uh, into the target uh, the same. Uh, yeah, you have to build, if the if the target is a 64-bit game, then you'd set M M64. Or if you're using a 64-bit operating system with a 64-bit compiler, then it should be the default. But here I'm setting it up, because uh, otherwise it won't work. Then I'm using the DL library, uh, which is the dynamic loader. Uh, we need to use it. And then you have the thread library, because I'm using threads, of course. Uh, this is for optional, for some more... Uh, uh, in, insights about uh, the stuff we write. This is important. This tells uh, that we want to generate positional position independent code, PIC, and this basically is code that can be injected. So basically, if you've ever came across a file that was in .so, a shared object, and this is probably the code was probably what we call uh, object uh, position independent, and then some optimization. This line is optional, it's for my text editor. Really don't have to set it. Uh, well, this is just to say that we want uh, all the files of the C++ extension in the SRC folder. Uh, then as I say the library is FMT. So when I write this, if you're from the future, then you might be able to write this instead. Because uh, normally uh, it should be part of this 10 dot by now, but compilers are a bit slow. Um, not compilers, but 
standout library is a bit slow on this. Uh, then there's uh, add library. This basically say that we're gonna create a library which name is gonna be hack. So it's gonna the file in the end we call libhack.so. It's a shared object. Uh, we add uh, some shared uh, sources which are these. And then we simply link uh, with the FMT that we, the library we just built right before. And so with this, it's actually very simple to simply have our project created. Um, oh, wait, did I? Okay, I might have modified something anyway. So here you're gonna create you're gonna create the main file, main C++. You really don't need to give it a name. If you've never programmed, um, yeah, there was a file like this. You should never program anything using um, shared, shared. If you never program a shared object or shared library or library, basically, you might you might not know about this, but we won't have an int main like you might think. We're gonna have an int dot function with um, yeah, we're gonna put some sort of um, yeah, some sort of uh, that's compiler dependent code. And that's going to be attribute, uh, I think it's startup, something like that. I will check a little later to make sure the code I write is correct, but uh, I think it's start with an S. Oh, constructor. Yeah, yeah that's it. Constructor. And then, um, well, it's going to be called when the program stops, like the, the game we're hacking, or when we unload. It's important that we can do what that we can unload without stopping the game because this will allow us to test uh, destructive. Now we have these two functions. This one is going to get called at the beginning, and this one is going to get called at the end. Okay, so I'll see you later when I fill in the blanks. All right, so I'm back a couple of minutes later. I completed the file. So as you can see, it's a little bit more complex than before. So I will explain. So I still have my two functions, start and stop, the constructor and destructor attribute. Here I return zero. This is just to say that the uh, the process of attaching our library to the program uh, succeeded. If it failed, it would return something else, and then maybe the program would hang. Or I don't. I'm not really uh, know knowledgeable about these. Anyway, so what we do is we create a thread uh, when we. Uh, attach our program so that we can actually do our modifications if they take a little bit of time the initialization if it's a little bit slow then the game is not stopped during that time uh, this is important because some video games might have something called a watchdog which uh, might might think that the game has crashed and might uh, disconnect us from uh, the game we're currently playing or um, that's in the best case in the worst cases it could be crashing the game or something like that so in order to avoid these, we just do that, but don't worry. Um, the uh, the final version of the initialized function does not take more than a second to do everything it does. So anyway, in the destructor, I join the thread. Uh, so it's a precaution that we don't really need to take. Uh, it's very unlikely, as I said, that we'll ever uh, have this will ever be called uh, soon, really soon after. Uh, really, yeah, when it's initializing, but anyway, I'm still doing it for some extra safety. Um, anyway, so here we have the function which simply print hack loaded, and here hack unloaded. And where is this going to be printed? It's going to be printed in the game's terminal, in the terminal where we're running the game with. And because this is something on Steam, it's not very easy to do. Um, so with this game, it actually turns out to be very easy to do. You go to the game folder and there's a uh, shell a bash script uh, that you can use to start the game. It's not easy with Counter-Strike Global Offensive. What you need to do is to start with the very special environment and um, environment variables and stuff. So I am back in the Zvin Co-op directory. And I'm going to run the zvincoop.sh script, which is the bash script that's responsible for running the game. Now that the game is running, and as you can see, we got a little error about Unicode. Um, yes, sure, there's a little bug. If you look at here, it's not. Uh, so it does not load this file because it has a, uh, it's a 32-bit something. It's, it's kind of strange. I tried to fix this in the past, but it's just a bug when you run it from the command line. When you run it from Steam, there's no problem. 
but well, yeah, as you can see here, there's the console. Uh, we can check if we, for instance, write something in the game's console. We say say something, and it's gonna say that. Um, oh. Well, maybe I could just write say, a. Okay, couldn't say not connected. So we've got some the error messages are being printed right here. Now we'll show you how to compile and how to make make sure that make uh, inject it into the game. Basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means. Now I am back. Uh, as you can see, I opened two distinct terminal. One of them is going to be for injecting our uh, hack into the game. This is required that you are you have some root privileges. There are some way you can actually. Uh, lower the requirement for doing such thing but this is not really what i would call secure anyway um then what you can do is simply see make dot dot it's like yeah we make it's gonna compile the first time it's gonna take a little bit longer now it's injected so if you look the list of files you have this libhack.so uh so this is what we want to inject right um into the game and now this is something that we are going to do with a program called GDB. So GDB is the new debugger program. It's very powerful and I very like it. It has a lot of features, but it's a little bit hard to kind of get to use it. So I would search first for the PID of Sven Co-op. I think it's been co-op underscore Linux. That's the name of it. Oh, why did I use over sign? Yeah, okay, so that's the PID. So here we type in attach. Uh, so you have the game running right here. So we just typed attach in 14.682. Now it's attached. And if you look into the game, it has frozen and I don't have anything displaying anymore. Uh, which means that the, the debugger has stopped the game. So we need the function that's, which, uh, which name is, which name is DL open set dollar dl open also cool. it's a function that essentially that returns a void pointer and that takes the name of the library we want to inject so the name of the file and then a integer mode dl open okay. yeah okay then we're going to call call dl open so here it's important you put the entire path um to the file completely so you can do this with a script later i'm going to show you the script i did for uh, for this slash lead hack dot so and with a two so the two here is a flag it means we want it to load uh, right after we call the dl open oh uh, it's kind of optional because it would do the same without adding the two but sometimes the loading can be deferred different different in some way okay then we type this and it says it says two did i make a mistake oh oh wait, yeah so the program okay so if it returns a node pointer like this this means it failed if it returns um something not null then this means this is the handle for uh, this library we were just injected. So this is like a location in the in the program's memory, in the game's memory. So now we've just injected, the game is still frozen. But as we said, it should have called the startup function. And here we can see hack loaded. So the startup function has been called. And if we type in detach, Now the game is running normally once again, as you can see the buttons, we can join the game. And I'm going to quit the game. Quit game. And now we see at the very end, hack unloaded. Uh, so yeah, libraries are unloaded in the reverse. I think, well, I'm not really sure about, yeah, when they are unloaded. But anyway, as you can see, we got a hack unloaded um, here. So this is very nice, of course, but we need to do now is to be able to do that uh, while the game is still running to unload the hack. Uh, and also, we might also do some a, a, a script that does everything for us. That does it for us so that we can, we don't have to type all these comments into GDB because if I quit GDB right now, uh, they're not going to be saved. So I will have to do set DL open. I will have to type this, which is 
kind of tiresome, so a script is the best. All right, so I am back. Now, as I said, I'm going to use Cheat Engine. So you need to download, so on Linux it works with a client server Dynamics. So you need to download the uh, CE server, which is the server for Cheat Engine. And then there's an executable, which you can execute with Wine. Uh, if you don't have it, you can actually run Cheat Engine on some other device. So there's a native uh, Android device and an uh, Android version, and there's a native Windows version, which you can run Cheat Engine and connect to your server. Um, well, of course, this would require a little bit of networking, maybe, and this would be a little bit hard to do. But if you really can install Wine, then you might want to do it with an emulator. You might uh, not an emulator, but a uh, virtual machine. You have uh, KVM, QEMU, and stuff like that. You might be able to do it. So you run the server like this. You have to be in root for that. Uh, once again, it's uh, related to the ptrace um, uh, permission. So if you give yourself ptrace permission, you might be able to do it. But you'd also need to give yourself the code injection permission. I don't really know uh, how to do it. I know it's possible. But in general, you should prefer doing it with a root account anyway. So I have the game here it's running, as you can see, stuff move, is moving out. And so I'm going to run Cheat Engine. Uh, so this is the Wine version of it. Now it's running. I will connect to the network. So this is the network here and here, but it rest the port. Default values are the one used by default. So you, you should be okay. Connect. Now you can see there's a bunch more processes. And now what I'm looking for is Vencoa. Now I am inside of Vencoa. Uh, so I can do some scanning and stuff, but that's not what I'm interesting about. interested about. So now we'll go into memory view. And this is the game's memory, so there's a lot of stuff. Here we have something. Oh, oh we should be looking at this is enumerate DLLs and symbols. This will list all the libraries, so it says DLL, but in its shared object uh, from, yeah, it's not DLL exactly, but it's basically the same thing. So you have a bunch of them. So we can see we have some that we might recognize, which has a libsqlite, uh, libglx nvidia, libglx, libx11, libgcc, libc. Uh, so these are the one from the system, and that's probably the one we're not interested in too. Uh, we might be interested in GLX if we want to do some drawing uh, involving GLX. This could be something. But then if you continue, then you see there's something called the SDL. This means that the game is using the SDL. Now we don't know what it's using the SDL for, because the SDL does uh, quite a a lot of stuff uh it does audio inputs i think it even does some sort of text rasterizing but i think you know, it's a separate file and anyway the, the text is in co-op is i don't think the using sel because it's really really bad looking um so we can look into the sdl and if you've ever used the sdl uh, you might know that there's a function that it's being called every frame, and it's uh, SDL, DL swap window. So we make a search for it, and it finds it. It finds it right here. Okay, so you can double click on it, and it will move you right here. Uh, so here, as you can see, the symbols are not hidden. This means the text actually corresponds to the function names. So the SEL is a C library, so overall the symbols here look very uh, intuitive. The names for them look very intuitive. Now if you look into some C++ library, so let's look into this one, libstd C++. We can see the text is it's kind of uh, unreadable. Uh, the, you, you can't really make sense of it. There's numbers, there's underscores, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, so I wrote a little program. It's called the demangler. So this is something called mangling. And this is part of the C++ API on uh, uh, the POSIX system. So uh, G++ does this, Clang does this, the behavior. 
uh, other compilers it may not. I think MSVC uh, it's not generates codes like this uh, because of the this is something that has to do with namespaces because as you can see symbols in the SDLs are very simple. They're just a function name, you know. And in C, functions are names in order to export into and shared objects need to be unique. And this is rather easy to do. In C++, people use namespaces, but you have, then you, therefore you have, you can have two functions that have the same names, but because they are in different namespaces and there's no problem. But at the binary level for the ABI, which is the binary uh, sort of communication interface, I would say, between, uh, binary files, then you need to export them with some complicated name. So anyway, I wrote this demangler. Uh, I might provide the source, but you can just type online GCC demangler and it will just work. So you need to write the symbols like this. It usually starts with an underscore and then you have demangles it for you. Uh, and so with this mangling, uh, what is being stored is the function names, the namespaces it belongs to. Uh, the uh, template specialization, it's, it only stores the specialization. If you specialize a template 10 times, then it stores 10 times these functions. And if it's a class, then it's going to uh, do it for all of its methods, which might generate very huge binaries. Anyway, if you know about templates, you, know, you should already probably know this. And it will also export the arguments, which is going to be very, very helpful for us. Uh, let's look into this. So this is client. Uh, it doesn't have lib, so I guess this one is from the game. So let's um, open one. So we have one that starts with C string. You have this one. Uh, so I think this one might take some arguments. Let's see. Yes, uh, it's even a const, meaning it's uh, a member of a class. So C string is a class starts with etc it's probably some sort of thing we do not know what types it returns that's one downside but you can something you can deduce if you go into the function so i just uh yes i just got to a uh, few things happening uh anyway um now if you look into these functions right here the line i'm clicking on I don't know if you can see there's a kind of a pattern in all these functions. There's almost every time this function called client underscore underscore x86 get pc func dot bx and if we press space, we go to this function. And here we have these uh, two instru two uh, instructions. So we move the values at the top of the stack into bx and then we return. Um, and now, um, well, it seems to be using this client x86. Let's look into another library to see if this is like the same. So it was talking about the SDL. So let's get back to our swap window function. You just click on it. And now, uh, there's another function call right at the beginning. Here, there's, oh, it's the same function, a6, a6. Here it's, what one is to get the same. Uh, so if you've never worked with shared objects and dynamic libraries like this, you might not know what this corresponds to. Now let's look into it. Oh, we can see it's the same thing. It's, it moves the values at the top of the stack into EBX and then it returns. Um, so this is something that we should take um, into consideration. This might actually help us. So I will just talk a little bit about these. So these are the symbols. Uh, that's their names and usually they are hidden. This is a rare case where where they are um, exposed like this and therefore uh, uh, this is one of the rare cases it's it's rough sometimes it's it's kind of often to see them being uh, some sort of uh, ciphered with some with some random names that change every time you recompile your project. There's a GCC flag for this. It's called uh, F visibility. Visibility. Visibility equals to um, F. Oh, visibility. And then there's um, these three things. There's default hidden internal protected. Um, so default automatically determines it's usually you've opened them like this 
hidden will give them this cipher name internal means that they will not be ex they will be exported but they will not be accessible um by via the general methods to get their address so therefore they might be exported like this but we might never actually uh, uh use them this can be used for static variables for instance i think this is even the default with internal um and then we have protected it which i don't remember what it does but by the name i think it's a little like internal anyway um so if the visibility default that means that uh, it was probably meant either it didn't change it or either it was meant for interfacing with uh, some other program uh, like what we're going to do even though uh i don't think they really want us to do to do it like this anyway so what they could do in the future builds of twin co-op is that they could set this flag and have everything hidden uh first of all i think there are some uh, third parties uh add-ons i think this uh, uh meta mode p which is used for servers uh which might not really like if they were to do such things but i think that's one of the reasons why they don't do it uh but now as long as they've released one version where the symbol names were not hidden uh in the next version we can actually do something called pattern scanning and the, we can use this as a way to get the patterns and in the next version we can pattern scan to get uh even if it's hidden we can use this but pattern scans uh is very slow it's kind of slow um so the method i'm going to use first to get the address of by, use, by using the name will be slow too but i will show you how to improve it and get it into a reasonable linear time uh, constant time yes constant time uh, so you, you type in a symbol and gives you constant time the value of this symbol uh, this is going to be pretty imp pretty crazy i'd say but this is really advanced right so there we are into our swap window and we have this call so it does about the same thing and uh i will do something which is i will place a breakpoint set breakpoint so it only supports hardware breakpoints uh not software on this operating system but it's i think you are limited to three breakpoints in total so here you can see the game stopped because it hit the breakpoint meaning that this function we thought was uh, responsible for drawing is indeed responsible for uh drawing okay so uh, sorry it just got back okay so now we are here we step into step here we are um yes go then we return so this has moved this address right into it and if you know about what this is as you can see the rbx matches the rip uh, register and the rip is the instruction um uh counter i think it's called instruction counter anyway it's the address of the current instruction and uh if you know about call directives it's not exactly the address i think it's more of an offset right but yes you can okay no it's definitely an address yes it's the address of the current function therefore we have a function here called uh which is used to deduce the current address right um we could be using our ip but this is not something you can do you cannot say oh i want the value of our ip so you have to use this as a trick um this is kind of um i'd say this is kind of smart because it's kind of you have five oh uh, you have five bytes here to one up code and to get uh and then you have a function here that sh that is shared among all of the other functions inside of your library anyway so get back uh to show you that it really does this so let's get back into this uh so we have the address so we have this so it's it's really is a constant i will show you how we can make be sure of this oh this is not this is the value uh so this is exactly uh so you have two bytes for the okay no it's not this one you have one byte for the call and then you have the uh, relative offset this is exactly the same as if we were to do ebx this this will take the same amount of bytes so therefore we can do it without really worrying and now we have an, a whole new instruction i want to show you this 
Uh, well, as you can see, it's definitely the rest of this instruction. I want to show you that the game will not crash if I uh, disable the breakpoint and let the game, the game run. Now the game is running once again, and we've replaced this function with a single uh, move. So therefore, we've actually made the game a little faster, especially considering it's being called a frame. But yeah, this is, I think this is micro optimization beyond levels anyway, beyond any levels at all. It's actually kind of crazy. So why is the game doing this? Why, why does it, why does the, all of these libraries need to get the address, uh, some sort of local address? The reason they're doing it is because uh, when you do, I just talked a little bit before about positional independent code, which is the type of codes that is generated by uh, for these libraries and it's because you do not know exactly where in memory these libraries are going to be inserted so there's a some sort of entry point uh, that is more or less consistent uh, by today's standard uh, there's some security people who said that it would be best if this was randomized every time so we talk about randomized uh, memory layout uh, so therefore, between two runs of the program, this library will not be inserted at the same address. Therefore, we never the, the program at compile time does not know uh, the address of a global variable. Knows the address of a local variable, not of a global variable. This sounds kind of counterintuitive, um, but that's it. And so, this is by returning this address because while it does not know the address it knows the offsets from the entry point and therefore by getting the local address it can deduce the entry point uh, or some other anchor somewhere where it can do as you can see here we add some little offsets and here the offset is slightly different uh, I don't really want to do the math but as you can see here the numbers are very very close I think if you were to add the, the distance between these two to this value then you'd obtain this one Okay, I, I might be wrong. Uh, oh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, so this is probably returning something like the current window or the the open geo state or something. Uh, I don't. I'm not really. I don't really know. We could. We could try to uh, try to look what's located into this address or something. But it's not really something we want to do right now. So I just said. We have this, and so we have this function here, which is the swap window. Uh, so therefore, this is a function that's called a frame. So what we want to do is uh, have our code being called right at the end, right? Um, of this function, so that it executes right after it, so that we draw on top. Uh, now there comes a little issues with this, it's that we have a bunch of jump of branching, and to get the and the rest of the function is a little bit hard here. It was kind of easy because uh, Cheat Engine tells us, but Cheat Engine is very, very smart. So doing it manually would probably be a pain. So that's why we want to do something else, which is much more easier, much easier. So here, instead of doing uh, these things, what we could do is something called a detour. Uh, so here we will instead of doing uh, this we replace like the necessary amount of instruction to make a call to our function in our library this would be the detour and what this function would do is that um it would execute you would finish the execution of this function okay and then it would uh right after finishing its execution it would execute our code with row on top and this is very easy. So we simply, to make a detour, we need to insert the bytes right here, right? But there's already instructions. So as I just said before, a call, uh, if you look into a call here, it's 32 bits. That's why I said 32 bits would be very easy. A call is five bytes. If you look into five bytes, we have this instruction, this instruction, so that's four bytes in total. And then we have this one. So we have these three instructions that we need to take care of for the detour. And once they will be taken care of uh, here, right here, we can put our detour function. Then at the end of our detour, we execute these bytes that we that we stole. Yeah. Then we uh, jump back to these uh, values. Uh, now, this is extremely straightforward to do in assembly in 32 bits. 
um, or I should not say 32 bits, but in uh, when you know that you don't have to jump over the four gigabytes limits. If you have to do this, then this is very much harder. And there's um, lots of different ways. There's some ways to jump at values at the top of the stack. There's ways to jump at the value, uh, the address contained inside of a register or something like that. Uh, all There's a lot of methods, but in 32 bits, it's very, very straightforward to do, very easy to do. All right, so in the next episode, we will dive into the code and see how we can do the thing that we did just now. So finding, finding the address of this function, modifying bytes in memory, all that in C++, uh, using the POSIX tools that are given to us. Goodbye, everyone.